Excellent. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism's Global Journalism Seminar Series. I am delighted to have the speaker with us today. Eli Truong has been one of the most impressive, innovative product design people. I've been watching her work all the way through from her time at Vox News to um, her, her appointment at the Washington Post. And I'm really honored that she's agreed to speak to us today. Elite has the kind of very impressive and new title of Director of Strategic Initiatives at the Washington Post. And she heads up their digital experiments. And she's also the kind of liaison with the advertising department. And I think this is a really interesting role. The Washington Post has been really good at creating new roles to face that address the challenges that journalism in the 21st century need to address. And I think the kind of role that you're doing at the moment is absolutely at the heart of this. And um, before she joined the post, she was um, spent four years at Vox Media, three years as product manager, again, for off-platform storytelling. And the other reason I'm so happy to have you speaking with us is you've been a real advocate for making sure that storytelling is diverse, reaches different people in the communities, and that we use the technology at our disposal to tell stories differently and to different people and to really make sure it's about the content as much as about showing off the whizziness of the technology. We'll use our usual format, so our elite will speak for about 20 minutes to half an hour, and then we'll open it up to questions from the floor. Please do type in your questions on the Q&A function, and I'll put them to her at the end. Everything is on the record and being recorded, and thanks very much, and over to you, Elite. Elite. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me, Amira. Thank you for the, the very kind introduction. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen um, and just make sure that that works. And, uh, and delighted to join y'all today. I'm, ha I'm happy to answer any questions that you have at the end too. Um, you know, I, when Mira and Kathleen asked me to, uh, to speak today to sort of kick off the new year, um, it, I really thought of like, what have we learned in the last year that helps us all think about what innovation means and experimentation means in this environment right now? It's pretty different um, to be able to set this kind of work up for success. I think it is now, core and not optional and it's it's vital uh, to every news organization to continue to figure out how can you change because the things that you've done before are not going to serve you well as we get shifted into these massively different news environments that um, are no longer stories that you're just reporting on everyone is living it right in this pandemic and working remotely be safe so how can you change better to adapt with this along with your audience and how to reach them so I wanted to talk a little bit about how uh, we originally planned for 2020 and also 2021 <laughs> and how that ended up being and things that we learned from experimenting through that and what, what worked for us. Um, I will go ahead and start and talk about our grand plans for 2020 pre-pandemic. So this is about this time last year when we were like, okay, so we know what the year is going to be like. This year is going to be, the biggest story is the US presidential elections. It's going to be a major consequence. We're going to gear up all our resources to kind of point towards that. Um, midway through the year, we know there will be a summer Olympics. So that is a double giant tent pole year. Um, it happens in US presidential years every four years. So that's also you know, a pretty heavy content year that we know of things coming up. And a lot of smaller things that we know that we wanted to be able to feature um, as well along the year, lots of uh, you know, preeminent uh, anniversaries. As we went along, we, of course, this happened for everyone, not just, uh, not just some people. Um, around, I would say, uh, you know, January, we started to trickle in and see the news, of course, um, especially happening in Asia and starting to spread a little bit February and then Italy. Uh, and then really, really, really in late February and early March, uh, the COVID-19 worldwide pandemic. Plans start to shift a little bit. Um, we need to jump on the story and delegate some of our resources that were already planned for other things as things start falling through across the world. Um, at this point, plans are simply deferred, not yet canceled. So we're like, okay, so we still have some things on the, on the docket. We'll plan ahead for this. Experimentation could keep going on. Not everyone will need to necessarily report on the pandemic. Um, as May goes on, uh, there is glaring, glaring issues um, of racial injustice and civil unrest, especially happening in the US, but around mm -hmm. the world. It is more important than ever that you know we address those issues, um, 
while they're happening during a pandemic, it's even more so uh, more so important. This is around the time that George Floyd was murdered in the U.S. as well, sparking protests around the world. Um, in July, wildfires and climate crises go on in the U.S. and across the world as well. Uh, kind of derailing things like uh, Olympics at that time, but also just so many other things are now swallowed up by these topics. August in the US, mail-in voting, you know, the pandemic is still swallowing up everything, but now affecting everything else. How do we report on these things that, you know, are really taking up all the airtime and attention and it's turning into a real lasting chronic emergency to, uh, to see how this pandemic affects everything else in, uh, in our plans in the world. Uh, what would that transition of power look like um, if uh, if our president does not concede uh, as as expected as as is traditional, and every other election complication and accusations of fraud? So knowing that that's another storyline, but still not the biggest story of the year as we expected. And you know uh, this this is what 2020 planning looked like from March to December of last year. Um, if I could sum it up in a theme, is trying to predict the uncertain future by reporting the present. And that's kind of how it always has been, but more so than ever before because our audience really wanted to know, like, what is the information that I need to know during these multiple crises? And what does experimentation look like in this emergency environment and chronic, uh, you know, we're 10 months in to the most severe parts of this pandemic. Um, and it's, what does innovation, what does experimentation look like and how do you build that culture to continue maintaining that um, when things are still an emergency and you're kind of hoping that things will stabilize in order to get back to that culture. It kind of means that you need to refocus and figure out what areas of experimentation are most valuable to your audience right now. Um, does it look like building a standalone feature that is like in a certain flashy sort of um, technical experience. Um, where are users spending more time now? Are they looking for uh, counter programming distractions that are not necessarily about these big news of the day? Um, are they looking for updates in general that help them answer questions? Can we do those in new ways using machine learning or something like that? Um, all these things are on the table of figuring out, okay, so you had to throw out your year's plans and you're not sure how to plan this year based on what happens. Um, what are your opportunities there? So uh, going into how we approach 2020 and how that informs this year, on the left here, um, we started out with in March wanting to explain, this is the big story of the year we're guessing, or hopefully not, not the entire year, but of course it turned out that way. Um, and explaining how the coronavirus works by looking at you know, simulations that are easy to understand based on uh, distancing models. So if you, let everyone go without masks, without social distancing, here's how quickly this group of 50 people will get sick or 50 dots will turn brown. Um, if you have some social distancing, here's how quickly this will spread. And this ended up being one of the most popular and tops of converting for new subscribers, like pieces that we did for all of 2020. Um, and this really helped us figure out how do you experiment with ways to explain something that is vital to understanding every other piece of coverage on the same topic for the rest of the year and the rest of the pandemic most likely. Um, it ended up being a foundational piece of service journalism that we translated into 13 languages around the world um, and took down from behind our paywall because we thought it was something that was of extreme public service and the same has been done for a lot of our other coronavirus um, coverage as well. Um, on the right here, uh, so I mentioned earlier the sort of climate crisis coverage as well uh, for 2020, um, and it was it was a devastating thing to see so many wildfires uh, be you know continuing to really ravage the uh, the Western United States as we went through multiple crises at the same time. We wanted to report that in a way that was very humane and um, and also visually captivating and engaging. So you learned as much as possible. So you stayed with us. Uh, what are the ingredients that make this recipe for wild buyer conditions? Um, and really connect that to the people in the community. So even if you don't live in California, even if you don't live in this part of the uh, country or world, you understand like the, you know, these are universal ingredients that happen around the world um, that are, you know, man-made uh, environments that really put us in these dangerous situations. So what we did here was we, uh, we approached our cartographers on our graphics teams. And what we wanted to accomplish here is 
harnessing all we could with our uh, biographers and satellite imagery that was available, um, weaving together portraits on site of what that uh, what that environment looks like, and really explain the conditions in which that uh, all these things can come together to cause longer lasting wildfires emergencies and how that affects those communities. Uh, this is something that I think was a very impactful story and really helps explain how you can tie together innovation to reach a lot of different people um, through storytelling in, in those communities as well. As the summer went on, um, we wanted to be able to explain the racial reckoning uh, that the entire world was going through and what that means. Um, and I think we could all acknowledge, um, you know, this, this story, we collaborated with The Pudding, which are uh, data visualization engineers that we've wanted to work with for a long time. Um, how do we contextualize where it all started in late May um, that sort of set off these protests around the world in solidarity? Um, so what we wanted to do was, you know, a lot of reporting focused on the really large flashpoints, the police brutality, like the moments of violence at these protests. We wanted to see what the first actual seven days looked like in the Twin Cities in Minneapolis and St. Paul in Minnesota, um, where George Floyd was murdered and, uh, and really see like, what did the first seven days of protests look like um, by stitching together over 250 social media videos on the ground protesters across the cities. Um, it wasn't 100% violence, as you might think, by Googling and like searching for on the ground stories from what those protests initially looked like. Um, there were flashpoints, but also just what we wanted to do was show a multi-camera view of here's what people saw, here's what they captured, here's where they were, um, and here's what happened along the way. So this was published a few months after um, May, and it was an analysis of here's where everything started and how it evolved over time, and here's why that happened. So it gave a better picture of protests for folks who have never been to one, and, uh, and it's something that was really, I think, gave a lot of good context, similar to the coronavirus simulation piece of understanding the stories that evolved from there. This is something that I think we're trying to incorporate in more of our stories in general. Uh, visual storytelling, something that's a little bit more approachable that you could take in lots of different ways, weaving humans, uh, centered portraits and really showing them in their you know livelihoods and your everyday lives during the pandemic and sort of weave, weaving that with more illustration and more visuals um, to be able to approach a larger audience um, this is a section that we did called future of work that we want to experiment a little bit of um, there's so much interest in what's what's next what is this going to do to us you know a year from now how might things change and there's so much interest in trying to figure out how that's going back to work in general. What we want to do is uh, to be able to orient these sections into applying to as a larger audience as possible a future of work and what, what might be next, consulting with experts. Um, so we experimented with being able to incorporate more illustrations here um, and interview a larger swath of folks across industries. So diversifying our sources a bit more and being able to, uh, to appeal to a wider audience here. Um, this was something that my particular team worked on. Uh, my team works on emerging technologies and bringing them more into the newsroom um, and also being a liaison to advertising as Mira said before. So this is really kind of figuring out um, how can we work with folks who have emerging technology that will be, uh, that will really change how we report, how we present stories in a few years from now. How can we explore use cases to help push our journalism and storytelling reporting now? Um, and how can we partner with them to be able to figure out those use cases that will help the industry a little bit later um, on, on the early end. So uh, this was our first project um, in, the, in the lab uh, that we experimented with reporting remotely uh, using 5G across the uh, United States. So um, we had to kind of figure out and want to tell the story of a small business supply chain. So at this time they were applying for um, small business loans for relief to try to keep their staff uh, and had to pivot. Um, so this was a Sonoma Valley, so Napa Valley, California is really, really known for producing um, beautiful wines and that's their main industry of, uh, besides tourism. Um, and really trying to, to talk to this supply chain of small business owners who rely a lot on each other for their own livelihoods and financial success. Um, what happened to the supply chain of folks? Um, how did they all pivot together and independently? Um, 
what what did the near future look like for them? And I think there was some hope to be able to uh, to check in every so often for these small business owners that might chart the course for many others um, as they're trying to figure out how to pivot their own businesses. So we were able to uh, stay in touch and safely report this um, by uh, staying in touch with the reporters in the field using 5G network, even though they were in rural areas and be able to produce this film um, and these video clips together uh, quite quickly and produce that. So that was something that really helped change the game a little bit more as we experimented. Uh, and as we moved on later in the year, um, luckily, you know, we still knew that the 2020 presidential elections were happening. That is kind of our bread and butter at the Washington Post. Um, and our bread and butter on my team, the experimental storytelling team, is really how do you tell those biggest stories in different ways reaching new audiences for us? So we did this in a couple of different ways. Um, the first way is visually and trying to follow along, uh, you know, live updates in different ways. So this is something that we have a little bit of a tradition doing and covering elections in visual ways. This one was kind of an interesting DIY sort of approach. Um, we enlisted the help of Scribit, which is this, uh, you know, robot illustrator that you mount to the wall. We uh, uploaded a lot of different graphics from our website. And we wanted to basically give you an option to not have to follow the anxiety inducing map in every detail if you didn't want to. Um, and this is something that we streamed on, we shared on Twitter, we shared on Facebook Live, like you might be watching, um, you know, on Facebook Live now. So we, we had that on Facebook Live as well. Um, and we, we live streamed the first 12 hours of the electoral map as it went on in November 3rd to November 4th. And over time, we basically just time lapse the rest of the results as they slowly went in. And so this experiment was really, how do you cover a story that you don't know is going to end and you don't know when it's going to end um, and how to reach that satisfying conclusion in different ways. Before we could generally tell the story of who won like within a day after, but uh, it was really several, several days after. Um, and we knew that that was going to be a complication for mail-in voting results and counting those. Um, and perhaps legal disputes um, and litigation. So what we want to do is tell the story um, and still be able to serve folks who are looking for results, slow news results like this perhaps, um, as they were falling for election night and be able to just sum up this page over time as we time lapse these results um, for the following states that really brought us to 270 to understand that story. So that was one way that we covered uh, Washington Post election 2020 results. Uh, the other way was through audio. So um, we have uh, a suite of different podcasts that we all launched, um, including our flagship podcast here on the bottom. It's called Post Reports. It's our daily, um, it's our daily news podcast at the, uh, the end of the workday on the East Coast. Um, so you get three stories basically of the day to kind of sum up and help you transition from work into your evening. So you really understand the biggest stories of the day. Um, what I was really interested in and what I've been obsessed with for a long time is the concept of the house ad. Um, and the house ad for, uh, for anyone who's not familiar is just a way to promote your own content using the advertising slot that you usually hear in like radio and podcasts at the top of the show. So um, I was just like, there could be a way to use that for editorial updates. You don't necessarily need to promote another show or anything. How can you use that in, in an interesting way? So we have this product called Heliograph, which we've used for years to cover election results. Um, anything that includes a lot of data like high school sports games. Um, we also have used it for Olympic results. We've used it to power a number of written articles and have those be live updated. So what we've done is build a, a number of machine learning um, enabled algorithms to be able to update a pre-written template that shows you here are the latest updates about, you know, Olympics results or the election results for South Dakota or wherever you're looking for. Um, what we want to do is introduce that on a new platform through audio and have that be spoken for the first time. So we customized an AI voice um, to be able to read those results to you. And we also took over, oops, sharing is paused right now. One second. Um, and we wanted to be able to, um, can you see my screen now? Yeah? Okay, great. Um, and we wanted to be able to, uh, to really take advantage of this new platform in a couple different ways. Um, 
we were working with an ad serving network through our podcast that allows you to geolocate certain messages. So if you are an advertiser using that network, that means that if you're in a certain location, you can get a slightly customized ad based on where you were versus someone else who's across the country from you. And that seemed kind of perfect when we were considering how do you deliver something like local election results, the local story from the national story that keeps on going on. on it. And if you are listening from outside of the United States, how can we serve you national uh, election updates as you went on, especially considering we're trying to tell a story that we know will last at least perhaps 10 days or more. How can we continue to tell you the story of things going on? So what we did was we worked with it within that ad network to serve you geolocated house ads that tell you the, your sort of state's election results as of you know that same day that you downloaded your podcast to listen. And I, let me see if I can try to play this for you as well. Can you hear that? We can hear a sound, but it's very quiet. Let me turn the volume up. So far in congressional That's races, better. Republicans have won eight congressional districts. Democrats have won five districts. One district remains to be called. In the race for U.S. Senate, with an estimated 94% of votes counted so far, Republican David Perdue has 50.4% of the vote, and Democrat John Ossoff has 47.4%. In Georgia's special Senate race, with an estimated 93% of votes counted so far, Democrat Raphael Warnock has 32% of the vote, and Republican Kelly Loeffler has 26%. In the race for president, with an estimated 95% of votes. So I think you understand the the sort of uh, the how complicated an update like that can possibly be. Um, and so we want what we wanted to do is like so that was a house ad that we targeted for Georgia listeners, for instance, um, towards the end of the race when we realized that there would be a you know a second runoff that would occur later in the year, early 2020, um, and really deliver them the local version of the national story as it applied to them. There were a lot of lessons to learn from this uh, launching heliograph and those automated updates through audio. And that was something that um, you know we're going to be experimenting with in different ways again too, and got a lot of good feedback from our audience. Um, this is the Washington. Uh, I just want to cover one or two other little things, and then happy to spend the rest of the time answering other questions. Um, and I'm kind of following this linear progression of really like what, like how do we continue to cover these different different places and what does innovation experimentation look like? I think there was such a broad way to apply innovation experimentation um, through formats um, and through service journalism in the past year that we're seeing really pays off in understanding our audience around the world or around the country. Um, what we did was also consolidate where we wanted to uh, focus um, big transitional moments in the US. So our election, uh, everything elections turned into everything transition of power and that'll turn, you know, what next looks like as the Biden administration gets started. Um, really, it also looks like what's on the right side too and playing with what does this look like with identifying Joe Biden's cabinet, for instance, who are the big players here? Um, who should we get to know and who does our audience need to know of because that's also the foundational understanding of what we'll continue to report on in the future. You can always refer back to this and you don't need to, you know, for instance, uh, wonder to yourself, like who is Ronald Klain, you know, uh, over time, it'll link right back to he's Joe Biden's chief of staff. Here's a running history of who he is and what he's done. So experimentation and innovation looks like things that could scale quite a bit, things that could be um, a little bit more uh, special project based and something that proves out new concepts for us. Um, and I think we've really taken a lot of those uh, that thinking into what 2021 planning looks like as we look at this year. A lot of question marks still, you know, we're still in the pandemic. Uh, there is, you know, vaccine coverage and making sure that we cover that around the world. There is still, you know, outbreaks and um, a really high death toll across the world. and. Uh, and going back into lockdown, as you're, as a lot of folks are probably experiencing across the UK as well. Um, so we're shifting more generally to what does evolution of everyday life look like? 
um, continuing to cover climate change and that how that affects folks because that can never be a background story. It's still, you know, everyone is at home and affected in those different areas. Um, remote learning, what does that continue to look like? A lot, of, a lot of topic areas where the stories can guide that coverage, just like how we considered the election special projects and covering those interdependent relationships of the small business supply chains. We're, uh, we're really looking how emerging technology can help us serve those readers and those listeners and viewers um, while they're searching for these kinds of topics in general. Um, I think that's all I have. So let me go ahead and stop sharing and uh, I would love to answer any questions that y'all might have. Thank you. There are quest millions of questions already in the in the Q&A box and I have several and I'll invite everyone else to keep keep typing questions in, especially to the journalist fellows at the Reuters Institute who are in their first week um, of, the, of their fellowship okay. as well. So do please join in and type questions. Can I just start, um, Eli, thank you so much for the presentation. And I took a snapshot of the 2020 planning document at the beginning because the best laid yeah. plans, you know, you know, where we are. Yeah. And um, can I just ask you a little bit about how you see the Washington Post and its relationship with platforms? Because the Washington Post as a brand is one of those brands that, you know, it has its own web page, its own presence, it's large enough, it's well known enough, it's, it's wealthy enough to draw people directly to itself. And yet, obviously, the platforms play a crucial role um, for you guys, everyone else. So when you develop your products, where, you know, where, where in your head do that, does that relationship sit? Oh yeah, I think as as we see the biggest opportunity to reach a growing global audience for us and become more relevant to folks around the world is really um, platforms to play a really big piece of that. Uh, platforms uh, where folks spend a lot of their time gathering information or we're able to reach them um, in different ways. It's a big part of experimentation in general. Um, it's it's absolutely vital. It's I don't think we'll ever live in a world where folks will the majority of you know potential audience will come directly to your owned and operated properties. Um, that means that dual strategies like are in hand for your really loyal folks there. We always want to be able to offer an incredibly good uh, owned and operated platform experience. Um, so that means our uh, homepage. Um, I mean, we have a, a large audience that still goes to our homepage, which I think indicates very well um, our apps, um, ways to see visual stories on our other apps. Um, I think those things are very important to invest in and then also off platform and what that means, which is really my, my uh, professional background as well. How do you reach new audiences through that? Um, what does Twitch look like as uh, a place to, to be able to reach folks through, you know, new video gaming content that we do and trying to appeal and, uh, and apply you know, the Washington Post strategy of accountability reporting to that industry um, and also culture reporting. What does it look like to uh, to look at Apple News, which has really evolved since uh, I remember working with Apple News as a product manager in perhaps 2015 when it launched. I think that was around the time, 2016 maybe. And it's just, it's a huge platform since uh, so much of our mobile audience comes to us from iOS and it's pre-installed. It's a lot of folks go there because they can see a lot of uh, different news sources at once and comparative stories. So it's it's really something that we wanna be able to figure out how we reach a large amount of, um, you know, folks seeking information from the Washington Post and other places and be able to add them to that sort of conversion funnel of eventually being able to be a habit that they, they go back to no matter what platform they're on and eventually be on the path to being subscribers. Yeah. I mean, staying on that point of the new subscribers you brought in through the new storytelling, could you talk a yes. little bit about who these subscribers are? Are they the profile? Are they the same kind of subscribers you had before? Or are you getting more, more women, more people from abroad, more minorities? I'd just be interested to know who the, who the newcomers are. Yeah, I think primarily when we're thinking about international expansion, what we wanted to do is be able to figure out how do you explain the biggest stories um, from around the world to our audience, um, primarily in the US, but also trying to figure out how to serve English speaking audiences um, around the world and trying to figure out that perspective. Um, I haven't looked at our latest breakdown from 2020. I think we're still pulling analysis from our experiments last year and trying to spin up new verticals and things. But I, it's something that of great interest to kind of figure out who our new, newest subscribers are and how we're serving them in different ways by spinning up these new content experiments and new areas of coverage too. Yeah, I'd be really interested in that. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to jump to the yeah. Q&A function and um, starting with Ted Sullivan on a very technical question, which I was wondering as well. Yeah. You mentioned yeah. multiple translations early on that the yeah. COVID uh, story he translated into 13 languages. Was this done by human translators or was it done by software? How, how did you do it? 
So it is, I think it's so, so important to, uh, to always have human translators in that because so much of the story can get lost. Um, I think we have, uh, when we've done experimentation with machine translation in the past, it can be an okay first place to start. Um, but you miss so much if you have like one analogy or one metaphor, even in an explainer, which sometimes we do have that, it gets massively lost and confusing. And then that means that it, that story falls below Washington Post standards um, in serving you that story in whatever language we decide to publish. So this is something that we've, uh, we've learned a lot actually from our global opinions uh, team outside of the newsroom as well, headed up by Eli Lopez. Um, who has been working with translators for a long time as well here and at the New York Times where he was editing before. Um, and so whenever we considered how we're going to uh, translate a story, we want to try to figure out, firstly, how are we going to promote it differently? So we reach audiences who speak that language and it's not just something that we continue to promote in the same ways as we um, serve our primarily English speaking audience first. Um, and also how do we, uh, how will we continue to measure and kind of figure out what is our potential audience here with something that's as broadly appealing as that story that we think is, is a public service. So, um, so that involves uh, human translations, it revol involves like human copy editing in different languages um, as quick as a turnaround as we can possibly get it. That's, that's impressive, thank you. Yeah, a thank question you. from Malvo in, Nicar in Nicaragua, one of our journalist fellows, um, ask about podcasts and how is yes. the podcasts, um, you know, how's the experience of covering news and developments like elections through a podcast different from other formats? You know, it's it depends on the strategy that you've rolled out for your news organizations. Mm -hmm. um, either you kind of follow the, uh, the assumption like public radio that you are going to report on um, live updates or you're having you're reporting while it happens um, but your audience because they're on podcasts they might not be looking like all looking for the latest updates because since we're all connected all the time they may have gotten that news from somewhere else so a lot of the time what we want to try to do in our podcast is commentary and kind of more context and analysis uh, and getting behind the stories because um Oftentimes, many of our readers may have already known the updates and the stories, but we want to still provide them that service. So when we're considering covering the election, we have a couple of different uh, approaches to it, um, depending on our shows. So uh, Daily 202 is a show that we had uh, with one of our correspondents, our political correspondents, who was really explaining that for lawmakers and people who worked on Capitol Hill. Um, and so that was one specific audience. Post Reports is a pretty general sh uh, show that appeals to our general listening audience um, of just like, what are the biggest stories of the day? What should we hear more about? And kind of delving into that with those reporters who wrote those big stories of the day, kind of explaining why is this of importance, anything else in the reporting that didn't show up in the story that was of interest. Um, and then our third political show, um, our podcast is called Can He Do That? Which is transitioning now that um, the Biden administration is uh, transitioning in power too. It was originally explaining you know, um, Donald Trump set a lot of precedents as uh, president, and a lot of that recurring question was like, "Can can he do that? Like, is that is that legal? Is there anything that, you know, uh, we can have in mind?" And so that was really focused on the president explaining um, what uh, what context uh, do many of those actions look in. So I think that's very important to try to figure out from which angles can you provide because shows how updates from election and who you're targeting may have already been served by you know uh, general news updates um, from the website and things how can you provide something a little bit more different uh, for folks who want to listen to that experience they probably want to dive a little bit deeper and hear from people and different people in that regard thank you i'm going to run two questions together that are kind of related one from jeremy gilbert who yeah. i'm sure you know hi jeremy and one from christina francisca who's oh, one of great. our hi, journalist jeremy. fellows from um indonesia and jeremy asks Wonderful. um for, for 2021 and beyond what are the most promising and ex exciting tools and technologies that journalists and those interested in journalism should be thinking about for the next generation of storytelling and christina's question which is related is a lot of what you talk about is amazing, but um, for small rooms, yeah. small newsrooms, especially ones outside the Anglosphere, don't have the resources yeah. to do do this. And what are kind of some examples of kind of simpler approaches and technologies that these kind of smaller, well, less well resourced newsrooms could do could use? Of course, yeah, I, I think I think about that question a lot as well. Um, starting with Jeremy's question, just simply because um, you asked that one first. 
Um, I'm really excited about those broader examples of technologies that can help us build over time. Um, I think machine learning, AI and automation help quite a bit. Um, I think image recognition can really help a lot in back, you know, behind the scenes reporting when you're trying to identify like where, like, uh, you know, when you're getting a lot of different videos and audio recordings um, in general, you're trying to figure out what, what in general uh, is happening, how many people are there, um, how, like, trying to figure out what the, you know, visual reconstruction of perhaps the capital siege and things like that might happen. Um, it's really important to have all these systems that you can from your reporting staff and also machines. So um, I think Heliograph was a product that was really interesting to figure out how do you tell this big evolving story? And there's a lot of different ways to use machine learning algorithms and uh, other AI tools to be able to help you consolidate a large amount of documents or a large amount of data to be able to tell you, here's what you want to know, here's how to control find and be able to tell you how many people were there, um, what the important you know lines in this document might be for your own reporting. I think that will help a lot in sort of reporting tools and narrowing down the story. Um, and ongoing with visual storytelling, I think augmented reality is something that is more and more accessible across all of our big platforms. You can see it as a service, um, you know, in 2020 and 2021 through Google Maps all these different sort of service apps in general and excited to kind of see how that evolves in storytelling um, as that gets available to a wider audience um, around the world as well. And that question about what can smaller newsrooms do to innovate in different ways? Um, I think I addressed a few of those things in terms of like what we found and what we invested in at the post is not just the sort of the bigger initiatives that involve um, complicated technologies or large engineering resources. It's really um, how do your readers and your viewers and listeners engage with you best? Um, what do you see a little bit more promising? And for us, that's been visual storytelling. So in any way, being able to use your resources, being able to figure out, can I use photos to engage this reader a little bit more in these stories? Is there any way that there are illustrations that I either can, I can commission or be able to use um, open source in different ways um, to draw my reader in a little bit more? Um, are there explainers that I could do um, that are specific to my community that I'm serving that's different from the larger, more global or general story? Like the, um, you know, I'm thinking about the COVID-19, um, the simulation that I showed earlier. We, yes, we did translate that into 13 different languages, but I think any, um, any newsroom who might serve uh, audiences within those different 13 languages can tailor it for their specific audience of here's really what that means and here's what that means for your community and things that we know that will be of a lot of service. Um, so I think experimenting in that sphere is, is very, very valuable and kind of figuring out how do you continue to be relevant to your audiences in a time that they're looking for a lot of information. Thank you. Thank you that you've answered a few of the people asking similar questions about the principles. Okay, great. So that's great. <laughs> it's um, it's always about, a really important question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, can I ask a little bit about the business side of things? There's a question from sure. Sofia Delgado, which is, you know, what basically what does success look like for you? You know, so what are your KPIs? Um, what are the results? Is it subscription reach? Or alternatively, are you free from that kind of modeling and, you know, you give it a free range to define your own terms? I would say that um, we're not free from KPIs, um, but our mission is really to kind of figure out what are the opportunities here. Um, and that is a mix of high impact opportunities. Uh, for instance, being able to explore what the future of 5G as it evolves as a technology in the US um, might be able to serve us a few years down the line. We directly use those results to influence how can we change the way that we report or present certain stories. Um, you know, and those are early lessons that other reporters around the room may not be able to dedicate as much time or engineering resources to, to figure out. Um, so those are the higher impact ones. The, the sort of things that are sort of ongoing are um, really figuring out how to scale our lessons to the rest of the newsroom and the industry in general. Um, is there something that really worked in our continuous experimentation that will work for um, you know, uh, our visual investigations team, for instance, is there a template like the George Floyd protest piece that we'll continue to work on for a complicated event where there are a lot of social media videos that they can quickly reuse uh, and be able to explain a similar event, um, breaking those down into archetypes and different kinds of events that we cover 
really makes that work that's really difficult to do for the first time every time really worth it. And we're measured on that as well. Um, and I think that's that's a great place to be able to figure out how do you create as many bridges as you can in your organization where um, the business side can power some of that longer term expensive uh, innovation and in trying to figure out how that goes. Um, and how do you serve your subscribers over time by giving them a more special experience or maybe a preview of some of these experimentations um, that we're supporting over time. So you, it, you kind of have a really nice way of being able to, to kind of look at different areas of how to drive this forward. Thank you. Um, yeah. Question for Wolfgang Blau, who was, um, who was at Condé Nast and is now with us as a visiting fellow and looking a great deal about the okay. issue of climate change. And he's asking, uh -huh. do you have any thoughts on, on using user gathered data such as climate noise or pollution data, um, you know, using citizen science sensor journalism and how would that work for you? Oh, I have been interested in a very long time uh, for this. This has been a little complicated by um, the pandemic, of course. Um, but I think this, the key to that is really understanding how can you either explain um, how, how climate change is a universal issue that a lot of people should care about, even though they may not experience the same kinds of issues that they're reading, but know that they will be affected in the same way over time. Um, or really explain, here's you know, this audience that's located in this kind of location that will be affected by this climate event. Um, what does that mean for you? What, what should you look out for and what's happening? Um, I think those are the two general ways to look at that kind of journalism and trying to figure out how best then can I deploy sensors to tell that story? Um, how can I best deploy the user generated data that I'm looking for to be able to serve my audience? Um, and I think sensors are extremely useful in trying to figure out how do you report in those ways? Um, how can you leverage generally the internet of things in that network to be able to tell stories around the world to make sure that you know folks understand we're all in the same boat here and we um, the story does affect you in different ways and, and sort of closing that empathy gap in that way. Thank you. Now, let's talk about where you sit and um, talk about storytelling and journalism and where you yep. sit as a kind of product and tech person within the yep. newsroom and your relationship to journalists. So firstly, part of it is how do the kind of traditional, you know, the, the more the, the journalists who've been in the Washington Post for a long time and there are several who've been there a very long time. How do, yep. what's your relationship with them? How do you interact with them? Um, what's the, what's the levels of trust with, between you and them like? And then in terms of the workflow, the, you know, in traditional, journalism the kind of idea starts with the journalist and then goes to graphics and photographs and interactive and so on and has that changed with kind of with your team with the arrival of you and your team do are there stories that are kind of driven by you first I think that's a, that's a really important organizational question because um, part of that innovation experimentation culture um, means that as folks with differing skills arrive in these newsrooms and that I think that started a very long time ago even with the advent of digital and that was a huge transition for every organization um, from where they started is to try to figure out how best can you utilize all the skills that you have on your staff. Um, there will be a really hard chain transition moment. Um, sometimes it's a very long era and how do you set folks up organizationally to succeed and try to work with each other? And that has to be integrated in the culture as well. So um, I really, I, I've learned a lot from, you know, my team is fairly young. I think um, the folks who have been in my kind of role, um, including Jeremy have been here, you know, in the last 10 years or so.
think we seem to have lost Elite there for a moment. Let's give her a few moments to see if she comes back. Hi, bro. Sorry for the delay. We've lost Elite there. So I'm going to give her a few minutes to see if she can join us. Come back. Okay, while, while we wait for Eli to come back, I'm going to draw on Caitlin Mercer, who has just jumped into the call. Hello, Caitlin. Yeah. Thanks for jumping in. Caitlin is the Associate Director of the Journalist Fellowship Programme. And before that, she was Managing Editor of Yahoo News UK and is very well placed to answer at least some of these questions. Um, so while I'm not going to pretend, if she's not going to pretend she is Elite on this call, I think there's a lot of issues raised here um, that are worth discussing. And I'm actually going to throw your own question back at you, Caitlin, um, which was about 5G content, which is um, a lot of news organisations have been looking at, you know, producing content for 5G mobile. And is, is this worthwhile? And what, what's your instinct? Wow. Uh, it's, it's honest. I, I asked the question because I, I'm not sure that I know the answer, but I, I do know that a lot of us have been told, prepare, the 5G is coming. Um, for me, it has the, a lot of the rings of what we heard in 2008, prepare the video is coming, 2012, prepare the podcasts are coming. Um, and in, in both of those cases, um, you know, I, I think we, we saw a lot of uh, pivots of investment and subsequently uh, a sort of dying off of, of both of those trends. I think it never hurts to think about new technology that's coming down the track. But I, I, my sense is that we unfortunately have to leave it to organizations like the Washington Post who are very well funded to really do the, the innovative uh, thinking and spending on, on new technologies. I think, I think it's very dangerous for, for startups who aren't well funded to, to go too far down the road too quickly. Yeah, absolutely. And then um, that, that's always the danger I you know, recommend some, you know, some of the articles that we published as well about innovation because newsrooms aren't well, a lot of journalism is not very well funded at the moment and to be very careful where you place your resources. And I know that a few of the journalists here, including Peter and Elliot Hungry had asked Eli that, you know, what if you're going to invest in one or two tools, what would they be? And crucially, are they the right tools for conversion rates as opposed to general kind of reputational uplift which is something that the new york times Washington to post the bbc can afford to do but other people could be very very cautious about um can i also ask you um it's a question from jacob um granger which is you know the, the, at, about the approach to test and learn which i know he's asking about the washington post but in the yahoo newsroom as well how would you measure the success of various experiments how do you reconvene how do you how often do you reconvene to assess program and how do you transmit this to journalists we've all had discussions about how 
the wrong data and the wrong you know information can be really demoralizing as a journalist so how you know how do you score the balance between needing to know the conversion rates and the click rates but also saying a fundamental issue is journalism i think it's an excellent it's an excellent question um uh, uh, i would i would say from from my personal experience and that's only at yahoo it's not the washington post and forgive the animals in the background um uh, that um, you you work out how you're going to track and how you're going to measure from the outset, from before you even begin the project, you've decided what you're tracking as as a success metric, um, and and I think the the answer is almost in the question. It's the, the main success metrics that that we're looking at these days are conversions to subscriptions and memberships and logged in users and um, and. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm I, I'm very aware that I'm not Elite, um, <laughs> and and so Mira, you might have some some interesting insight on that question yourself. Um, I think um, Rula Khalaf, who's now editor of the Financial Times, spoken about that spoke about this as well, and. Um, Obviously, the metrics and the data is crucial, but you have to start from who are we? What is our mission? What is our purpose? What kind of journalism do we currently do? What are we trying to do? Then you look at your audiences and your readers. So you look at who your readers are. You make sure that they are being served. You don't want to lose them, but you also then look at who do you want to to um, attract. And that's where the, the data and the metrics are utterly invaluable. If say, we know, we know who we are, we know who's listening to us or reading us, and now we need to know how to get to these new people. Welcome back, Eli. I will leave you. Thank you. Caitlin Mercer has been jumping in to ask some questions. Caitlin, you've disappeared. Um, but thank you so much. Uh, so we've asked, I've asked Caitlin some of the questions that would have come to you because she was managing editor of Yahoo News UK. So I have some experience of running kind of newsroom and management technologies. You're still muted, I think. You're still muted. Can we unmute you? Good, good there times. You go. Yes. Great. Oh, I, I'm, I, I was saying, um, I'm sorry to have missed that. I would have liked to hear some of those answers, but apologies you know technology snafu is working from home <laughs> absolutely no thank you and everyone has every sympathy and i've been through every variation of things going wrong on these zoom calls so that's absolutely yeah. fine um a question from ivana velishkova mm -hmm. which is what is the best article video material length to keep audience attention um and to help people understand and remember the information i mean this is the this is the uber question about journalism how long can we keep people with us and i'd like to know what, what your instinct is and whether you think um it's changing or evolving i think it i think that is a really interesting question to always kind of keep in mind and experiment mm -hmm. with um i think the assumption that in every format we need to um, be quick and to the point helps us as a principle, um, but there's there's definitely some formats that we want to be able to to figure out like how can we tell this longer story that really is um, something that you can dig more into and understand more, especially if it's a really big topic. Um, there should be lots of different formats for continuous storylines that you're working on, right? There, there's the quick sort of snapshot stuff that you could post on, for instance, Instagram. Um, I think those, the Instagram galleries of sort of like the service journalism that I've been able to see are kind of genius, um, leveraging that format uh, and the stories overall in general cost platforms. There's that version of the same story that you could tell um, using thousands of words and beautiful photos and things like that. Um, I think it really just depends on the format and the story that you're trying to tell. Um, I think it is important to try to figure out how to structure stories that if you are going to pursue the longer version, um, that there is a smaller way, like more doors that you can open to more audiences by making it more understandable or on different platforms and transforming that same story to reach different audiences in different ways. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then a question from, um, from Ramisha Ali, who's in Pakistan. So kind of dealing with a, an audience where it's largely mobile driven. The huge growth is in mo mobile, but also in audio and video. And yeah. I'm asking about data journalism and wondering, is it, um, what, what, is it more of a challenge to give users similar experience on phone screens and on touch screens as on desktop? And where, you know, how, how mobile focused are you on what you do on data journalism? Oh yeah, I think that's that's been a struggle since we've um, mm. since we've realized as an industry um, of information that the trend is always going to go 
or at least in, you know, based on recent history in the last several years is on mobile first. That's how you make things as most as accessible as possible. Um, and that means shifting to going to your own mobile device more to, to design and to read and to lay out stories rather than um, what you might use, which which I primarily use, which is my, my laptop and my desktop, right? And that's where that biases gets in the way of just like, oh, it's easier to design or it's easier to think about how to reach folks in that way. Um, I think that is a healthy exercise that I like to do with my team every so often of just as much as we can, a few hours of just like, we're going to work on our phones primarily, you know? Um, how does that teach us about how hard it is to get to our own site, how to engage with our in own information? Um, it's something I know our design team does a lot too, to try to break themselves out of that desktop first and then mobile translation thing that is, um, you know, sometimes hard to do. And that I think that extends beautifully to data visualizations as well, of just like, how can you take advantage of this platform rather than see it as a task to translate um, and have a sort of a second uh, tier experience that way. Thank you. And a question from um, the course director of uh, MA in Global Journalism and Public Relations at Coventry. You talk about your hire team, um, you talk about your team, a lot of them being very young. And so based on the highest you've done and your team composition and skill set, what advice would you have for aspiring journalists and their trainers in an environment where tools keep, train keep changing? I think adaptability, if you, um, you know, I've been I've been very fortunate to um, to not only work with my team who I directly manage, but folks across the newsroom and across the industry and my my previous roles in journalism too, who have all different levels of experience um, that we can take forward to learn more about. Um, you know, like how does print experience directly translate to how we might be able to tackle a new workflow that we might not know as much about, or how do we continue transforming the post? Um, you know, leveraging and taking advantage of stuff that we already know that worked in different formats, you know, and bring that into the future. Um, I think that's that's a really big uh, skill to know of just as a manager, how can you, um, what are the opportunities that you see to bring out the best in people and bring project teams together? That's what I really like about working on projects that allow you a little bit more time to work with folks who you don't manage necessarily, um, is being that connective tissue of just like, hey, do you know this other person over here who is interested in your like area of interest? Maybe you can work on something together or just talk. You don't need to work on something together for the first time there. Um, and I think uh, when you're thinking about training in that way, that's, that's a really good first step to being in training adaptability as a skill. Um, I think to continue forward in journalism, um, to survive and to make a good living and to sustain your audiences, you have to be open to being adaptable more than ever. Um, especially in this environment of uh, what audiences are looking for are changing all the time based on the, you know, the environments that we're living through uh, across the world. So um, being open to meeting different people with different skills within your new, your own newsroom is a great place to start to understand, oh, we have more in common than we think. You think differently about the same topic that I'm looking at. And that helps me get unstuck in my own projects and things that I'm considering. So I think that's that's something, that's the number one thing that I would be looking for and encourage continuing to work on uh, no matter where you are in the newsroom. Thank you. And one final question before I let Great. you go, you go back, and it's very early where you are as well. Um, first, I really want to know about the kind of atmosphere of the, what, in DC yeah. at the moment. Um, and then the final question is um, from Mark Ramsey, which I, which I you know, it's always a good question, right? which is, you've talked about some of the brilliant innovations that have worked really well for you. What yeah. hasn't worked? What would you say, yeah. what are the learnings <laughs> from the failures? <laughs> um, I, I'll, I'll go ahead and start um, uh, chronologically. So uh, the environment in DC, luckily um, where, where I live is a, a, like a mile or two north of Capitol Hill and the, the siege last week. Um, which I can't believe was was a week ago. Um, I think uh, we we just realized that this is you know the last year has brought on a lot of different sort of citywide emergencies and curfews that are emergencies and struggling through the pandemic and trying to get that under control. Um, the D.C. area is flanked by two other states, so it's really a tri-state area when you think about it. Maryland, Virginia, and D.C. are all in it together. Um, and folks commute in from those those states also. So it's basically thinking about us all in the same environment. It's it's pretty tense. I think trying to understand what might come up ahead for inauguration in a few days is, uh, you know, we're thinking a lot about the safety of our journalists. Um, 
you know, two were arrested briefly uh, covering what was happening in Capitol Hill. So really just trying to keep top of mind of keeping all of our folks safe um, and trying to look out for the safety of our audience as well and, and reporting on the things that they can do there. Um, the failures, it's my favorite thing to talk about because that stuff teaches us more sometimes than the things that work out automatically. Um, you know, I think there have been, uh, I tried to set my team up to prototype a few different ways and to think what I call thinking sideways about each project that we do. Um, we have a little room to uh, try to figure out what different approaches might work for the same things that we're trying to pursue. Or, so for the election experiment for audio, uh, there are a lot of things that failed about that along the way until we came up with a product that actually worked. Um, what kind of ad serving network like serve, you know, uh, helps us geolocate. For instance, we were like, should we target congressional districts um, and let you know what's happening on your congressional districts? When we tested that, that seemed kind of creepy um, that we knew that kind of data and we want to zoom out a little bit too, just in case we couldn't find and locate the district or the correct district and we didn't want to troubleshoot all that way. Um, there are failures baked into every successful project that you see. Like I, I almost guarantee anywhere, like something didn't work out as planned along the way. And I think considering that if you can adapt and if you can pivot and adjust that idea, um, it will be successful in some way and teach you something that you should learn for the next initiative that you do. Thank you. Eli, thank you so much for this thank amazing you so much for having talk. Me. We've been so lucky to hear you. Um, Next week, we will have um, Sophie smith Galler, who is a journalist with the BBC, but also uh, a journalist who's built her own brand on TikTok and used it um, in a really in innovative, informative way to kind of combine journalism and brand building and storytelling to again, reach out to new audiences. So do sign in for that. And in the meantime, Eli, thank you again, stay safe. We look forward to everything that you and the Washington, produce, Washington Post produce in the coming weeks and the coming months, um, but certainly the coming weeks, the you know, eyes of everyone is on you guys at the moment. And thank you all for your questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them, but we will, um, you know, these are some of the topics raised in the Q&A are things that we're going to carry on discussing throughout this term seminar series, so do keep coming back. Thank you all, and thank you, Eli. Thank you.